I'll, I'll just get straight to it. Um, you said that um, you were extremely happy as a child. Your early years spent um, with your father as a judge in a, what I imagine to be a snowy village. What do you think about your childhood made you want to write? I think I discovered very early on in life that uh, this miracle of using letters to form words and to see words form a sentence and a sentence and another sentence formulating a story. It was a sort of miracle to me and uh, I must confess that I never in my life after that being seven, eight years of age, I, I never contemplated doing anything else but be a storyteller in what way I couldn't say at that time, obviously, but uh, no, I, I, I know that one of my most profound privileges in life is that I to do, today do what I dreamt about as a child. I really don't have any more intelligent answer than that. It was just the feeling of the miracle, really, of using the language. And um, from what I gather, during the 70s, you were involved in a lot of political uh, protests and things like that, and the, an the anti apartheid movement and these things. Do you miss that sort of activist energy and idealism? No, I still believe I, I have never left it. I mean, uh, being a writer, being an artist to me is, has to be combined with uh, an urge to talk about the world we are living in. And it is a very simple fact that we are living in a terrible world for most people in the world. is life very, very hard and difficult. And, uh, uh, and naturally, I will always primarily be a writer, but I can always choose what kind of stories I tell. And besides that, I can use sometimes the fact that I am a quite a prominent person. So if I speak out in political contexts, it could have an effect and then I think as an intellectual I should do that and whether that be the fight against apartheid, whether it was for the liberation of the African countries or whether it today is a fight against the new apartheid system in Israel against the Palestinians, that is not so important. I mean I have to behave like a real intellectual and that to dare to talk out, to speak out. So how did visiting Africa change you? Or how did visiting Africa periodically change you? Uh, I think that I come from a very little rich country in the world called Sweden. And that is a very decent society with a strong civil society and where no one really is suffering in any way. Uh, but it's also a fact that normally people in the world does not live like the Swedish people. Whether in India, whether on the African continent, whether in many in Brazil or wherever. So to me, to understand the world I'm living in, I had to see it from other perspectives. And that is what drew me out in the world when I was young. And that is what drives me out when I'm beginning to be old. And it, to understand better the times that I'm living in together with you and the photographer here. So, so in the session, um, as I told you, the thing that really caught my attention was your dislike of the word happiness for it being too commercialized. Can you just talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think if you, if you look in the newspapers or magazines or TV, I mean, happiness is consumption. Buy these jeans, you will be happy. Change this car for another car, you will feel happy. Uh, take your wife with you and buy this new house, you will all be much happier than before. So the world happiness has been completely in a brutal way commercialized, so it doesn't mean anything anymore. But I really, uh, I think that that world shouldn't be used anymore because we are fooling people by saying you, you, you shall be happy in the commercial version. We should tell people to to work to, to try to create a better world. That would make you feel better. And instead of using this terrible word, happiness, which is a commercial term, uh, termin terminology today, really. So with regard to your literary career, was theater your first love? 
No, it was the writing. Uh, and I never had any wish or whatever to become an actor, that's absolutely. But what interested me was that directing had very many similarities with uh, writing. It is the way that you, you, you create the world. The difference is that when you write, you are alone. But doing theater, you do it with people. And I find it so remarkably interesting that I can sit alone in my room and write. And one day I can rise from the chair, open the door to another room where it's full of people with whom I can make theater. And then one day I can go back to the first room again. So, uh, but if I had to choose, okay. God, God forbid, but if I have to do that one day, I would say goodbye to the directing. Because basically I am a writer. And with regard to crime fiction, what um, what do you think makes it such a um, ripe genre to write in for you? I think that uh, writers has always understood that using a mirror of crime to look upon contradictions in society is a very efficient way of telling a story. If you go way back 2,000, maybe 3,000 years ago, look at, this, for example, the ancient Greek drama. They used crime plots almost always. So did Shakespeare. And so has authors during our times did. Dostoevsky did it. Joseph Conrad did it. And even in your wonderful masterpiece, Mabarata, it's used. And that is because you see the conditions of life in a way very clearly when you have these contradictions of crime in the mirror. So I think it is, therefore, it is such an efficient way of, uh, of telling stories. So we are not the first generation believe, to think this. I mean, people have always been thinking this. And so coming to Kurt, Wall Kurt Wallander, um, he's, um, I mean, I was reading him and I got the sense of a very misanthropic man. And that, of course, is not new to male protagonists in crime fiction in the last few decades. So, did you ever consider writing a happy detective? Well, there we have the word happiness again. Huh? Yeah. So, we can, so that's we can the, take that away. Yeah, but take that uh, away. the thing is that if you look upon statistics for the police force in a country like Sweden or in a country like Britain or somewhere else. You will find a lot of police officers divorced. You will find a relatively high rate of suicide. And if you think, you have a, an average policeman going to work in the morning. What on earth will he uh, experience during that day until he eventually comes home at night? So I really believe that I can understand that many police officers are feeling very bad because what they see during a day so, uh, therefore, I felt it rather natural to have a man who is, uh, yeah, he's marked by his work in a way. So, I was reading about your many current projects, and uh, one thing that really caught my attention was this proposed TV miniseries on your father in law, Igmar Bergman. Oh, but yeah. I sort of have a larger question, which is what, what kind of potential do you see in film as a medium? Uh, I, I think that I am, if I would say that the living theatre is more important to me than the film, the okay. movies really. But that is because I lived with the theatre. Uh, when Ingmar Bergman died, and uh, you know, he's the father of my wife, and uh, I had a very close relation to him. And then I thought it would be of interest to write about his life. Not the biopic of his life, that wouldn't interest me at all, but uh, I would be interested in um, the price he paid, or to be honest, the price his family paid for the way he was not compromising in his work as an artist. And that is what interested me. And, uh, and we, uh, I, I proposed this to the Swedish television and they said yes immediately. Okay. And now it is going to be an international TV series because this man is probably the most well-known Swede. 
and uh, I think I have managed to write a fairly good uh, story about it. And I'm also very happy with the, the director. It's decided that's going to be Susanne Beer, which is a Danish director who is very good. So I'm quite happy with everything so far. We haven't chosen the actor for Ingmar Bergman yet, but uh, that will come during this year. Okay, they've, they've told me that this is the last question. Okay. But I know you love telling stories, so... Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a short one or anecdote? Oh, or? it's difficult. <laughs> so short, no... If, I, even what, one of the ones you no, don't... No, no, I, ca I can't do that. It's no, too long. Okay. But what I can tell you is that... Uh, something that at least someone should tell the politicians, and that okay. is, you know, that we people have two ears, but only one tongue. Yeah? Yes. It's obviously because we should s listen double as much as we talk. Yeah. And that would be a good ending to this talk. Thank you. Thank you.